Hello everybody, welcome back to Simplified. My name is Michael. And I am Gurjot. And this is episode 4. So in this episode you interviewed Karen Woods. And her dogs. And her dogs. They yes. were in the office. Yes. Professor Karen Woods is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Science and Technology at ED at Zurich. She told us three main things. Tell One, me. red wine is great for your health. Two, Indian food is great for your health. Three, sitting up straight is not the best cure for backing. Oh, okay. <laughs> then let's get going and find out more. We're sitting here with Professor Karen Woods. Thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Could you, in a very simple way, tell me exactly what your research is about? Mm-hmm. Our research is focusing on basically trying to better understand pathologies and then coming up with new treatment options. Um, we are specifically focusing on inflammation uh, in diseases and how to control and modulate inflammation um, so that uh, there is a better therapeutic outcome in the end. And we're working in different areas. Um, ranging from back pain and the involvement of inflammation in back pain, which a lot of people have, so it's usually something that a lot of people can relate to, um, to other areas such as skin projects, where we also look at inflammation and skin aging, or, um, for example, projects on uh, electrospinning, where we create scaffolds and nanoparticles with substances, also for therapeutic use in the end. So it's very broad. Okay. uh Okay. So your focus is on inflammation. Uh, can you tell what's the science behind inflammation? Wh- why? How does it happen? Why does it happen? Well, normally inflammation is part of the the normal healing process. So okay. it's actually a, a good thing. Uh, it's a way of the body to react to an injury or to pathogens invading your body. Um, but in a lot of diseases, the inflammation kind of goes out of hand and it's not controlled anymore and becomes chronic. And that is of course not good because then a lot of bad uh, things are being turned on um, and this is why controlling it in in the case of diseases is quite important okay so uh, how, how do you how do you do it like how do you do it do you simulate these things or do you look at actual patients or do you th- do things in the lab mm-hmm. how do you go about this well it's a combination of all of those basically okay. <laughs> um, we work a lot with clinicians from these we get samples from patients and then uh, at the beginning of each project, we look at what is actually happening in, the, in this disease tissue, um, inflammation, but then also other aspects that we look at, uh, degenerative processes, for example. Um, and then once we understand what the, let's say, molecular mechanisms of a disease are, then we're trying to develop new treatment options. So these are usually pharmacological treatments. Okay. We work a lot on, on biotrucks, so substances yeah. from nature, basically, taking nature as a, a good example. Um, And then we try to formulate these drugs in a smart way so that they are released, um, for example, over sustained periods of time or in case a specific um, disease pattern occurs in your body. Um, So we're trying to tweak the the therapy so that it's as perfect as it can be for you. Uh, These biodrugs that you mentioned, um, so we also interviewed Professor Michael Nash at ETH who he told us about uh, they create these uh, certain antibodies that can kind of encapsulate the a certain cell or say cancer cell that you're trying to do. Is it similar? Mm, not really. So we're working really with um, substances that you might know from food basically. For example, a substance that we've been looking at is, is resveratrol. It's found for example in red wine, which usually people <laughs> like a lot. Um, or also with curcumin, which um, people know from Indian food. Um, and uh, these then isolated in a very clean way. We use these or we chemically try to modify them or incorporate them into release systems um, so that they can then have an effect in the body. Because a lot of these drugs, they are very potent, mm-hmm. uh, even so you don't really think about that when you think about food, but in a higher concentration, they can be very efficient and they also um, normally don't only target one specific mechanism in the body, they target a lot of different ones, which is why um, you can use lower concentration and still get a, a decent effect a lot of times. So drinking a lot of red wine can do you good? It depends. <laughs> yes, <laughs> too much might not be so good. It also depends uh, what kind of application you have. But uh, okay. yeah. C- can you uh, tell the details of how this goes about? Uh, say if you look at the molecule present in red wine, 
w what does it do exactly? Mm -hmm. um, so the red wine we've been using in a project on, on back pain. So we looked at how um, this red wine substance, it's called resveratrol, can interfere with the uh, pathological inflammatory mechanisms in the disc. And we've done that in cell cultures. So we get samples from patients from the hospital and then we take the cells out and we um, then test the substances on these cell cultures. Um, and we also go into in vitro and in vivo models that are more complex. Um, and basically in the end, but that's kind of a long-term goal, this would then go into a patient. And we have a, a substance now that we look at, which is called epigallocartin galat. It's in green tea, it's a polyphenol. Uh, very well known in the pharmaceutical science area um, and that has very good effects as well so at the moment we're trying to um, create microparticles made of electrospinning or better say electrospraying and these will then be at some point of time hopefully injected into patients um, as a treatment for back pain also uh, when you finally get these uh, these uh, medicines mm -hmm. i could say how, how would they be applied? Do you spray them? Do you swallow them? How does it work? It depends uh, which application you target. So for the, the back pain mm -hmm. problem, um, the, in, in those patients the, the pain would come from the intervertebral disc, which is the, um, uh, the tissue between your vertebra, mm -hmm. uh, which makes you flexible in the spine. And in, in these you would actually need to inject it into the tissue because if you take it orally it's not going to end up in the disc. There's no vascularization so it's not going to happen. Um, but in other areas, of course, you could also apply it topically. So we also have a, um, a project where we look at diabetic ulcers. These are the, the wounds in diabetics, usually at the feet, that don't really heal mm -hmm. well, yeah. uh, that are often infected. And in this case, we are incorporating the resveratrol, the dirt wine substance, into a new wound dressing that would then improve the, the healing of those diabetic ulcers. Ah, th th that's very interesting. And if I'm not wrong. You also have a degree in pharm pharmacy, right? Yeah, that's my original master's that's degree. That's your original yeah. master's. So, how does that help you with the research you do now? Um, well, truth to be told, a lot I have forgotten forgotten <laughs> about what I learned at that time. Uh, but I guess I am um, the this uh, this um, uh, love for the natural substances, the natural drugs that certainly comes from from my original degree, um, and also the understanding of how you can actually target um, specific diseases pharmaceutically um, that is certainly also what has influenced our research. Yeah, can you still explain how medicines actually work? I mean that'd be a good question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is a very difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> I mean in, in a simple way like what happens when you swallow medicine wh where does it go? It, surely ends up in your stomach. Where does it go from there? <laughs> well, it depends on, yeah, you see, so you have different types of how you can apply medicine oral. Uh, so swallowing is uh, uh, obviously the most common one that everyone yeah. knows. Then, of course, you have different ways also, um, IV or intramuscular or transdermal, like those um, uh, dressings or plasters that you have okay. also for, um, for pain medication, for example. So when you swallow a drug, then, of course, it... Uh, um, it gets into your body, then normally into the stomach and uh, the GI system. Um, and it will bind to receptors in the specific areas and um, there have its effect. But then of course it also goes further and at some point of time the body needs to get rid of it. So what happens is it, is it goes into the liver, at least with the oral route. And there um, enzymes will work on, on the drugs that you've taken and will create metabolites which can be active or not. Sometimes it's actually that the, not the original drug, but the degraded ones is what is actually then doing the job in the body. And at some point of time, then it goes out of the body again <laughs> with your normal digestive system. But, but the naive question is, how does it know where to go? Right, like, I mean, it, I have no idea how this works, <laughs> so, clearly, but so, it goes into your stomach and then you say it degenerates and ends up in the liver where it it's, gets, gets formed into another kind of molecule. Yeah. How so, does it know wh wh where it hurts? <laughs> well, for example, if you have pain in, let's say, your arm, you're not, your drug is not going to your arm and, and counteracting the pain directly there. This would only happen if you inject it. Like sometimes okay. you do that also, right? You have, I don't know, neck pain, and then yeah. you get an injection into your neck with a cortisone derivative, then it works directly there. But normally it really works 
uh, via the bloodstream it comes to different parts of the body where there are receptors that are um, uh, regulating pain development and then that's where it works which is also exactly the problem so you might take a lot for some pain in some peripheral area but you get a lot of side effects in your stomach or uh, wherever yeah. just because it's not specific so you talked about disc degeneration and uh, what uh, so how, how do you fix it? it I'm sure it has something to do with tissue regeneration uh, mm -hmm. is, is that also part of your focus? Do you look at tissues and try to create synthetic tissues, I guess? Mm -hmm. We have certain projects where we do that. Um, for example, we're working on uh, the Zurich Heart Project, which is a very big flagship project in Zurich with ETH University Hospital involved. And there we really make a kind of an artificial uh, organ. We're working on a biometric blood okay. propulsion system. In case of the intervertebral disc, it's a bit tricky because uh, the disc is a, a tissue that degenerates very, very early in life. Like when you're 20 or 30 years old, you can almost be 100% sure that you have a certain degree of disc degeneration already. Okay. But you don't necessarily have pain. So the degeneration does not really directly correlate with the pain, which also means that if you just regenerate it, that might also not necessarily really help or it might be over ambitious because what in the end is really important is that you somehow counteract this pain development. And this is what we're trying to do with controlling inflammation. Um, of course, if you want to be really ambitious, you can try to regenerate and you can use stem cells, for example, for that. Um, and we've had some, some projects in the past where we worked on that. Before I ask you about stem cells, uh, let's wrap this disc topic up. Mm. So should you just sit up straight? Would that be a good thing to do? Because they always say like you, you can get a hunchback and that can have adverse effects on your spine. And I was also reading a poster outside about some load bearing on spine and different experiments done on mm -hmm. that. So it's just sitting up straight normally a good thing to do <laughs> to prevent this degeneration? Uh, not necessarily. It will help to a certain degree because when you sit straight, your loads will be different compared to when you hunch over. Um, then they will be a little bit higher on the intervertebral disc. Um, but the mechanical loading is only part of the the degeneration story and the, the pain ah. story. Um, it becomes worse if you're someone that lifts something heavy all the time, that might mm -hmm. have an impact. But the sitting straight is actually good because part of the back pain will not come from the disc. A lot of times it actually comes from the muscles. You probably know that from when you're studying for an exam and you're really stressed, yeah. you get really tense and then you get back pain and that's actually muscle related back pain which luckily also goes away usually quite fast. Uh, but the, the sitting up straight helps predominantly for that. Um, and okay, so it helps from muscle pain, not exactly disc generation. Because you said that's going to happen anyway. It, it, it does. It's just a matter of how early or late it happens. You yeah. can, of course, help trying to make it later. But then genetics also has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're just <laughs> screwed by your genes. <laughs> um, yeah, and then in the end, uh, well, a lot of people have this degeneration, basically everyone, but not everyone has pain. Um, so this is really what it comes down to. And that's a very tricky uh, tissue from that respect, because a lot of tissues, when they degenerate, they will cause problems. But the disc, not necessarily. Hmm. Is, there, is there other sort of degeneration in tissue that's common apart from disc? Maybe the, maybe the knees? The, the knees also, and the, um, in that case, it's the cartilage. Okay. And um, the, the disc and the cartilage are actually quite similar structure-wise. And what is um, the most crucial similarity is that both of them are avascular, which means there's no blood vessels directly going into it. So in your muscle, for example, you know that you have blood vessels going in and they pump in nutrients and so on, which is why you can actually use your muscles so nicely. Uh, but in the disc and the cartilage, you don't have that. So you have cells that depend on nutrients, but then there is not a lot of nutrients, which means that they are like starving basically um, and this is one of the reasons why these two types of tissues degenerate quite early in life. Uh, does this relate to nanofibrous membrane for extracellular matrix? I was reading another poster. <laughs> 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 That's just what I got from there. Yes, uh, it does on a certain level. We use those uh, nanofibers for uh, a lot of different applications but one is also the disc and in this case we are working on a project um, where when you have this degeneration, what happens a lot of times is that you get a disc herniation. And what that is, uh, is that you have two different zones in the disc, an inner one, it is more gel-like, 
cusp and an outer one that is called annulus fibrosis, which is more fibrotic. So it's kind of a uh, ring-shaped structure, very tough. Um, and sometimes you get defects in that structure. And then what happens is you get basically a hole uh, and the inner part squeezes out and then it squeezes on the, the nerves in the spine. Um, and that is causing pain and um, also numbness. A lot of because people it have presses the nerves. Exactly, okay. yes. And it also irritates the nerves chemically. Um, and then what's, what's happening most of the time is you tend to wait a little bit, you get physiotherapy and you get pain medication. And if that doesn't help, then they will take your disc out. Um, and they will either what's called being fused. Um, so they put a little piece of bone or bone replacement in and then they just make it stiff in that area. Um, or they put a disc replacement in, uh, which is a flexible uh, implant, more fancy and more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes they try to be not so invasive and they just take the, the material out that has been extruded, um, so the, the herniated material. But a lot of times what happens is that this herniation comes again, so more of this inner material is being squeezed out and you have the problem again and you have to go into the hospital again. Um, and we try to prevent that by making a, a patch basically with which you can then close off this outer area and the defect so that the inner part will not come out anymore but you can reserve some of the, uh, the tissue and don't need to take everything out. Uh, so is this also somehow cheaper and better than just getting a full disc replacement? Yeah, probably compared to the fusion which is kind of the old-fashioned uh, system where you make it stiff, um, that is um, probably would be cheaper because we're not so far yet, so it would be more mm -hmm. experimental. But those total disc replacements are actually very expensive. Uh, the medtech companies, they also yeah. want to earn money, so yeah. <laughs> they do that <laughs> extensively there. Um, and, but it would, of course, be better for the patient because you, when you take the entire disc out, you change a lot in your entire posture and the ability to move. And if you can um, maintain as much tissue as, uh, as possible, then it's, of course, uh, a good thing. It's, it's always better to have the original parts in your body then then replacement. some replacement that can get damaged yeah exactly yeah. okay now you mentioned stem cells mm. can, can you tell me what those are everyone talks about stem cells i'm pretty sure there's a hundred thousand fake chinese websites <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> about stem cells you know that kind of fix any problem you ever have in your body what what are these magic things <laughs> so why stem cells are so cool is basically um, based on uh, two different um, characteristics of those cells um, that are very different from all the other cells in the body. The one is that a stem cell is um, what we call undifferentiated. So it's kind of like a, a baby that can grow into all different uh, jobs, you know, if you would want to okay. compare it to real life. So it become, when you get, give the right stimuli, it can get a muscle cell or a cartilage cell or whatever. Okay. Um, and they can proliferate a lot still compared to other cells, so they can grow a lot and expand. Um, so that makes them very interesting and you can quite easily get them out of the body. Um, originally, like years back, what was mostly done is that you would get stem cells from the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. um, that is basically what has been known for, for decades. Um, but of course, do you really want to give your bone marrow? It's not that something that you would like to do so easily. Um, and there are also not so many cells in the bone marrow. But then at some point of time, people realize that in fat, there are quite a lot of stem cells. In fat? Fat. And I mean, everyone wants to get rid of fat. So <laughs> all you would need to do is a, a liposuction. Okay. Um, and you to, can get lots of stem cells from And it. you can get ah. lots of stem cells. Um, so that's, of course, a nice um, alternative. And then you can use these stem cells um, to put into a, a degenerated tissue, for example, trying to regenerate it, or you can use it for cosmetic uh, applications, like, you know, put it in your scars or, oh, yeah. um, or whatever. Um, and this works actually relatively well, even so for the more complex applications, we're not really as far as the, the normal magazines want to <laughs> make you believe. <laughs> Um, but there is a lot of potential, which is why so many people work on it. And uh, more recently, there is a, a new concept. So originally, what would happen is you would take your biopsy, it could be fat, could be bone marrow, you would bring it into a, a lab, uh, from the hospital to a lab, and then you would expand the cells so that from those few stem cells that you get, you actually have a lot. But then for approval, for example, FDA approval, that's quite tricky because you transport the cells back and forth and you never know what's happening. Um, and now they, there are actually machines that you can put in the OR so you can do your liposuction there. 
like the doctor will do it on you, of course, yeah. uh, take the fat, put it in the machine, and the machine magically, it's basically a centrifuge with digestion, okay. gets the stem cells out, and you're still in the OR, and then you get your stem cells back in. Ah, so um, you just so eliminated the entire process of taking it to another lab and getting exactly, it. So it's yeah. all in a machine now. Yes. How long does it take? Does it like dramatically cut down the time you need to do it? Yeah, it takes like an hour or so, whereas oh. normally if you would expand them, it takes two or three weeks. Okay. Of course, you start with fewer cells, so maybe you don't have uh, such huge effects, but of course it's much easier and also less expensive. Um, and then again, I mean, fat, you're probably happy. Most people are <laughs> happy to get rid of quite a bit, so <laughs> you can use uh, enough uh, source material to get your stem cells. Uh, the, these stem cells, so they're like clay in a way. You, know, you can just mold it into w whatever you want. H how do you teach them what to do? Or do they just learn from whatever is around them? That's exactly how it works in the body. So you, during your development, um, that is how an arm knows to become an arm and a foot a foot and a liver a liver. Uh, but you can, of course, try to simulate that also in the lab. And it's not as trivial as it sounds because you have a lot of different cues in your body. So these can be mechanical cues, for example, but also chemical cues, so um, hormones or growth factors. Um, and if you're really good, then you can simulate that and then your stem cells will know what they need to become. And for certain tissues, it's already achieved relatively well, and what for others, not of, at all. What kind of tissues? Uh, well, there are a few what we call lineages, so what a cell becomes, uh, what kind of tissue that are um, the most common one, if you want to prove that a, a stem cell is actually a stem cell, and that is cartilage, okay. um, fat, <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> enough, <laughs> well, and, it's, and it's bone. Isn't that, isn't that, because you get it from fat, and then you use that to prove that it is like yeah, they still, apart from fat, they would also need to be able to make bone and cartilage and so on. Um, so we call that um, uh, potency of the stem cells, how many okay. different cell types they can uh, in the end become. But and, and they multiply much faster than other types of cells. Mm -hmm. okay. And can you use them to replicate neurons? What do you mean? Uh, so you said stem cells can become liver cells or cartilage mm -hmm. or anything else. Can you also just put them in the brain and replace dead neurons? Well, if they, if that is enough of a cue for them to know what they need to become, in theory, yes. In, theory, in reality, yes. not necessarily. But yeah, okay. a lot of people um, try, for example, in, in, in the knee for cartilage, you just take the stem cells, you put them in, and then you are basically assuming that with the the information that they get from the resident cells plus the mechanical loading and so on, they will know what they need to be and they will become a chondrocyte, so a cartilage cell. Okay, um, so in theory it's possible to use stem cells to pretty much regenerate anything in your body. Yeah, that would be the hope, it's just that okay. we're not really there yet, not but maybe, yeah. yeah. And then it also depends of course on how complex is the, the tissue that you want to make. The more complex it is, the more complicated it will be. Mm. That's very fascinating, actually. <laughs> it is quite cool, yeah, <laughs> which is why it's a it, it very hidden topic. Al almost sci-fi. <laughs> you could just regenerate an entire human being in the mm -hmm. lab. <laughs> How far do you think I'll be from practical applications? Well, we have a few applications where it's already uh, approved for, for okay. uh, clinical use, um, but in other areas not. So I think the idea of making entire organs with stem cells, we're not really there yet. but. Uh. To, to repair some defects, yeah, that works. Okay, and could you give a brief overview of what your daily workload, like not workload, but how do you go about this? You said it's a mixture of simulations and clinical trials and in the lab experiments. How do you go about it? What, what, what comes first, what comes after? Do you simulate things first and then do trials? How do you go about it? Um, well, we normally start with um, relatively simple cell culture experiments because you can, um, these are basically simplified models that are nice because they're not as complicated as your entire body is, where a lot of different aspects play a role. Of course, it's also a tricky part because mm -hmm. it's simplified, uh, so it <laughs> might not be true what you do. Like a podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is what we normally do first because we can also screen a lot and try different things. Um, and then once we've done our cell culture experiments, we might go into an organ culture experiment. So this would be with entire tissues 
um, and then at some point of time you could even go into animal models uh, if you want to go towards clinical application you will need that as an in-between step before you can go into the patient and I also saw on your profile that you have an MBA in lean hospital management <laughs> well <laughs> the MBA is in uh, um, leadership and sustainability. Yeah, but, and, your, uh, and your thesis was, was on lean hospital. Exactly. Two questions. One, why did you choose to do this? And two, how does it help you in what you do now? <laughs> well, why did I do the MBA? Um, I did it because you learn a lot of things that in industry you might be quite aware that you need them, but in academia not necessarily. So leadership, mm -hmm. for example, it's something that most people here just do trial and error, yeah. which sometimes is good and sometimes <laughs> is really not good, at least yeah. at the beginning. Um, so I felt that this would be something that mm -hmm. probably would be quite useful uh, when you build up a group. And um, you also have things like marketing, for example, which I think scientists are, most scientists are awfully bad in yeah. marketing their research on themselves. So this can be quite helpful or also things like uh, strategic management. So how do you actually make a long term strategy, mm -hmm. which also, in academia is really essential, but no one is really thinking so much about it. Um, so these are the things that I learned, which I thought were quite important. Um, does it help me? I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you probably need to ask my people if they're yeah. happy or not. But um, I, th I thought it was interesting and it was something that yeah. I wanted to do. So I actually uh, enjoyed it also being forced to, to do something completely different. Normally, you would just not invest the time into <laughs> And the, the lean hospital management, that was the, the thesis that I did. And I just wanted to stay kind of in this m medical area that I'm anyways working on. And I thought that was an interesting topic. So yeah. Could you quickly tell us what lean hospital management is? Is it uh, just a better strategy of managing things in the hospital? Is that what it is? Basically, yeah. So the okay. idea is to uh, to run a hospital in the way that you don't have too much what they call waste. Um, so if you think about being in a hospital, a lot of times you see nurses running back and forth and you can optimize these processes a lot. And then in the end, it saves money and time. And then also the patient will have much more time for interaction with the nurse, which is certainly more important than yeah, yeah, running a marathon right. during yeah. uh, <laughs> while you work. Yeah. Um, so it, it helped. The overall idea is basically to, to improve the quality of a hospital. Um, for the patient, but then also saving money and making it a better workplace for the employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think that's um, enough of science, but <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> um, one last question. Um, uh, what resources would you recommend for anyone who's interested in following your research? I mean, anyone who's interested in um, tissue regeneration or things that you do? say for someone who is in the academic setting, maybe a bachelor student, maybe a master student, or someone who's entirely unrelated to it, uh, I don't know, drives a truck or something, mm. and it's just interesting in doing this. So what, what resources do you recommend? Well, I think for the, the research side, the, the ETH websites are actually quite informative. You will find uh, a lot of information on what people do, what papers they have published. Of course, that is really quite scientific. So maybe yeah. you need the, the background for that and be a master or bachelor student. Um, we are always open to, to discussing uh, with people in person. Um, so people shouldn't be shy in contacting us. That's something that we actually really um, enjoy. And then maybe on the not so super scientific side, you have a lot of TV shows in the meantime. Um, that focus on science, but more for the, the normal population. Mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe a really good starting point to get into it and then follow up on, on a more okay. in-depth knowledge. So when you watch some TV shows, like these medical shows, like Dr. Oz in, in the United States. How <laughs> I don't really watch that. <laughs> <but> yeah. <laughs> when you learn about these, these shows, how do you feel? How do you react to these things? Like, does, you're like, but this is entirely false. Is that how you react? <laughs> Well, most of the time they are quite true, just a little bit exaggerated a lot of times. I mean, of course, you need to sell your information, so you, mm -hmm. you will market it accordingly and you make it sound um, 
more fancy and more advanced than it is. And yeah, I get slightly irritated with that, but it's still informative. <laughs> so <laughs> I think okay. it's, a, it's a good way to get into the topic. <laughs> okay, here, here's a question we've, we've asked before to other people as well. What's on your bookmarks bar on your browser? Do you have a lot of bookmarks or do you have very few? I actually have very few, yeah. Very few. Th that's very interesting because uh, another interview we did before, uh, he just had four or five bookmarks, which we found very strange because uh, you must have lots of bookmarks because you have so much things to look at. But yeah, no, I don't really have a lot yet. <laughs> some, some funding agencies that yeah. I have and um, that's almost that's it, it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. So okay, <laughs> that, and so that that I just, I, I just find it hard to believe. <laughs> I thought it's just full of and a Google Scholar and an archive and this and that. No, I think I'm just old-fashioned and I tend to type the things in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you, uh, what kind of programming languages do you use for your work? Do you use any programming languages? No. No, not, not at all. No. It's, it's just all experimental stuff. Yeah. In my group, it's uh, we don't do computer simulations or so. Oh. Um, if we do something, then it's very, very simple programs that are basically already almost pre-made, like MATLAB programs and yeah. so on. But that's it. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> and I see. I see you have dogs in your office. Does that help you with your work? That you have your dogs with you. <laughs> makes an easier environment, I guess. I guess, yeah, it's it's nice. And, uh, yeah. The dog enjoys it and our uh, students enjoy it a lot. Uh, a yeah, lot of times of the, the parents have dogs at home and then now they have don't have dogs anymore and uh, <laughs> then they are always very excited. So uh, it's good for everyone's mood, I guess. Uh, it's yeah. actually funny if you see people when they, they see the dog, then they're all smiling and chatting with the dog yeah. in different languages. The dog must speak, I don't know how many <laughs> languages. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, does she get to run around the floor or does she just stay in your office? Oh, she can visit people. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <She doesn't. laughs> so long as she doesn't go into the lab. She cannot go into the lab, but those doors are closed anyways, yeah. so that's good <laughs> and no problem. No, okay, I, I guess that was very interesting and thank you so much for talking to us and telling us about all these fantastic magical devices you've been <laughs> working on. It uh, was fun too for me. Thanks. Yes. And we hope to maybe get you on again sometime. Yep. I would love to. Thank you for listening. If you liked it, we'd really appreciate it if you shared it and gave us your feedback. We publish a new episode every week. For more details, visit our website simplified.xyz.